Our next speaker is Mark Mewson. He's professor of biomedical informatics at Stanford and director of the Stanford Center for Biomedical Informatics Research. Mark conducts research related to intelligent systems, reusable ontologies, metadata for publication of scientific data sets, and biomedical decision support. His long-standing work on a system known as Protege has led to an open source technology now used by thousands of developers to build intelligent computer systems and new computer applications for e-science. He is also principal investigator, principal investigator of the National Center for Biomedical Ontology, as well as the new Center for Expanded Data Annotation and Retrieval, or CEDAR. Thanks. Thanks so much, Amy. Let me thank the organizers for inviting me. Let me thank all of you for making it through this morning. I understand that I am the main obstacle between you and lunch. And I, I, will, I will work hard to make sure that everybody is uh, well fed. Uh, what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is give you an introduction to a new center that we've just started at Stanford, something that just got funded last fall, something which we call CEDAR, the Center for Expanded Data Annotation and Retrieval. Uh, we like the acronym. We particularly like the idea that it's a tree. It makes it very Stanford-specific, although I guess it's the wrong species of tree, but that's okay. Um, I'm going to tell you first that in the past 30 years, biology has radically changed. I think you all know that. It's gone from a very descriptive science to one which is data intensive. What you see on the screen is an example of a microarray showing how some 30,000 genes get turned on and turned off in the course of some biological activity. And the advent of high throughput High throughput technology and biology has really changed the way people think about the science and, and more, more importantly, the way they think about their data. And one of the things that we deal with in biology right now is coming up with mechanisms to deal with large numbers of data and also to recognize that because of the large numbers of data, that obviously increases the opportunity for mismanagement of the data and for misinterpretation of the data. Uh, and in fact, I think biologists in particular are very sensitive to all the lay press that has come out in the past few years, recognizing the fact that, as we've heard many times this morning, data get misinterpreted and um, the science as a consequence uh, fails. NIH, of course, is very sensitive to this problem. And one of the things that they've been struck with is the need, first of all, to deal with the problem of replicability of biological experiments, and also just to deal with the vast numbers of data and to make sure that those data are available so that people can actually make sense of them. Uh, a couple years ago, uh, NIH began a new initiative called the Big Data to Knowledge Initiative, or BD2K. Uh, and BD2K uh, is a great buzzword, but it also has been a great opportunity. Uh, last, uh, well, I guess in 2013, uh, there was a call for participation, a call for applications for centers of excellence in big data science. NIH, of course, doesn't define what big data science is, but I guess we know it when we see it. And uh, ultimately, 11 centers were, were named. And actually, what's really exciting is that two of those centers for big data science are at Stanford. I'm going to be telling you about one. The other is uh, Scott Delp Center that deals with uh, mobility and, uh, and, um, and, and, and disability associated with, with, with those kinds of problems. Uh, the BD2K initiative uh, has been particularly exciting because it has really focused attention on the problem that we have so many data in biology, we don't know really how to manage them. And our center, CEDAR, is looking specifically at the problem of making the data that, our, that the government requires that be stored online actually be made accessible and interpretable. And for our purposes, that means making the metadata associated with online data sets usable. Because one of the real problems in biology, as you've already heard this morning, is that there's very little incentive for people to do a good job of authoring metadata. In fact, there's very little incentive for people to put their data online in the first place. Uh, what's true in the case of migrating experiments and a variety of other outputs from high throughput experiments is that the journals and, and NIH are very stringent about requiring those data to be made available, but they're less stringent about making sure that the metadata are good and that people who look at the metadata can actually figure out what the experiments were. And so CEDAR actually is taking the tack that what we need to do is not necessarily worry about enforcing the uh, requirement that the data be put online. We think NIH will eventually do that pretty well itself. But we know that people basically hate metadata, and we need to come up with better mechanisms for those metadata to be useful. 
Now, here's an example where actually the, the uh, community has been successful. The microarrays that I've just shown you became widely available online through a public repository known as the Gene Expression Omnibus, or GEO, uh, about 10 years ago. And one of the real problems with GEO, as you can guess, is that the experimental data were there, but in the absence of high quality metadata, no one really knew how to interpret those data. And so the community got together and created something called the Miami Standard, the uh, Minimal Information About a Microarray Experiment Standard, which was basically a checklist. It was a checklist indicating what are the kinds of things that you would want to include in your metadata that would allow another investigator to actually figure out what you did. And what I think is an interesting theme in, in biomedicine, particularly in biology, is this increasing effort on the part of the community to rally around the idea of creating these standards for what metadata should be for their data sets. Now, I'm not going to argue that people actually use the standards or use them well, but the standards are emerging, and Miami is a good example of that. But Miami has problems. Even though Miami is required now by GEO, the Gene Expression Omnibus, as basically a framework for filling in the metadata that get associated with everything that investigators put online when they want to store microarray experiments in that repository, um, many people would argue that what the community viewed as a minimal information set was really not all that minimal. And in fact, when you look at, uh, uh, at the online metadata in GEO, although this example is, pr is pretty well filled out, most of the fields are, are, are pretty, pretty, pretty much blank. Uh, investigators don't have a requirement to do a good job of filling in all the data. And as a consequence, the repository suffers because you really can't really take advantage of what the creators of the Miami standard had intended uh, when that standard was initiated. And so basically, there's, there's a real need to lower the barriers to making it easy to, cr to create these good metadata. At the same time, the kinds of templates, or at least the kinds of, uh, of standards for metadata in biology are just exploding. And so what you see on this slide are a few of the kinds of uh, standards that are stored in the minimal information about a biological or biomedical investigation portal, uh, which tells you about, for example, uh, Miami and uh, um, MIAPA, which is the minimal information about a phylogenetic analysis or uh, my favorite, Miss Fishy. I actually don't even remember what Miss Fishy stands for, but there are all of these all, the, all of these metadata standards emerging, but they're problematic. They're problematic because even though they become under this umbrella called biosharing, which is an initiative led out of the University of Oxford to bring together all of these uh, standards for metadata, fundamentally the approach is very limited because the standards are basically checklists. They're checklists that emphasize what to do with metadata elements for very well-defined experiments. That's the good news. But there's very little consideration of what are the value sets for the actual elements of that checklist, what kinds of standard ontologies might be used to supply those values. Basically, because they're just checklists, they have buy-in from the community because they're so simple. But they're not terribly useful in a computational sense because they're just, as I said, checklists. And there's complete freedom as to how one would actually uh, translate those checklists into some sort of data representation that would go along with some data set online. What I think the, the world needs and what the community recognizes is there's a need not only for these kinds of checklists, but for turning those checklists to something that's more computable and something more expressive. And indeed, some of that is already happening. We have good collaborators through the Human Immunology Project Consortium, or HIPSI. HIPSI is a, well, as you can see on the map, a consortium of, of, of some, some of the major medical centers in the United States concerned with human immunology, as you would guess. There is a standards working group within HIPSI whose job it is is to create metadata. And here's just one example of what they're doing. And unlike the biosharing initiative, HIPSI is starting out with a computational mindset and saying what we really need are more expressive metadata templates that indicate exactly what are the kinds of slots in these templates that are necessary, what are the particular value sets we, we might use to fill in those templates, and ultimately coming up with a mechanism whereby not only will the data be made available online, but the, the, the metadata will also be made available in a way which makes them much more searchable and computable. That's important because, as an aside, within the immunology community, NIH has created a data repository called IMPORT. 
Import is the place where the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases requires its grantees to store their data results. So there is already an NIH-funded repository for biological experiments in this particular community. And within that community, the, the human immunology folks in HIPSI are working to come up with even better metadata standards based on these kinds of templates. So what we're trying to do within the CEDAR project, ah, that's where I was going. In CEDAR, we're taking advantage of close relationships with HIPSI, with the standards working group in HIPSI, and the import data repository to create a, a whole ecosystem to enable us to deal with metadata in a way which I think has not really been possible previously. So the HIPSI investigators are working really hard, doing their everyday job, doing experiments on human subjects, uh, investigating a variety of immunological phenomena. The HIPSI standards working group is creating these templates, like the one I just showed you, that are more expressive than the biosharing templates. So biosharing is going to be catching up soon. And ensuring that there are well-defined connections between the data types of those templates, well-defined ontologies, basically giving us the framework where we can make our metadata much more com computable and much more interesting. And our ultimate goal is to take the data sets created by HIPSI, the metadata that we'll be authoring through these templates, and to store them in import, that data repository that I mentioned that is being funded through NIAID. So the goal of CEDAR is to bring all of this together and to use that as a sandbox, where our goal is to build uh, computer resources that will make it easier to build new templates, to put templates together, to fill in the templates with appropriate values, and to use those templates themselves as a way to inform the authoring of future metadata that we're going to be putting online. That sounds a little bit abstruse. Let me give you a sort of a flow chart of what we're doing. The idea is that we have biomedical scientists who are like the HIPSI uh, standards working group building templates that will define the kinds of standard information that we expect to see when we have data sets from certain kinds of high throughput experiments being put online. We'll be, we're creating tools that will allow investigators who want to uh, define more complex metadata standards, bring together components. So there might be a way of describing the template needed for a particular kind of experiment, the template required to describe the investigators and in their institution, the template required to define the substrate of the experiment, whether it's done in people or in mice or in, in rats or whatever, to create a composite template that investigators can then fill in using a workstation, presumably in a, using a, a web-based kind of platform. And what we think we're going to be able to do is that ultimately, not only will the templates that people fill in become the metadata that get associated with the online data in the import repository and other repositories, but at the same time, by storing the instantiated templates, we will be able to create our own repository of the metadata that have been authored in the process of putting all these data online. By having a repository of everybody's metadata, we have a great resource because we can mine that resource and look for uh, patterns in the metadata, associations in the metadata, with the idea that by looking at these patterns, we can help the original authors of metadata by doing predictive data entry. We can see when authors have put in a particular value for one slot that typically there's another, this particular value that goes into another slot. When a particular slot is left blank, some other slot requires a value. And by looking at these kinds of patterns, we're hoping that we can make suggestions to the metadata authors so that at least the task of filling in a template that, like the one associated with the Miami standards is not nearly as complicated and not nearly as onerous. I mean, that's a hypothesis. We're just getting started in this project, so I don't have results to show you. But the goal is to see what we can learn from the template, uh, from the metadata repository that will ease the construction of the individual template descriptions in the first place. The idea is that this CEDAR technology is going to give us mechanisms whereby authors can create new metadata templates. They can assemble those templates into the composites that are necessary to bring in information about all the various aspects of a particular experiment. And they can fill out those templates to be able to annotate their experimental met metadata in a way which is much more comprehensive than takes place when things are basically left to chance as what, ha as what happens now. Those filled in templates then get stored in the repository where we can learn new metadata patterns and hopefully guide entry of new metadata. 
and also because of our longstanding work in developing uh, technology through the National Center for Biomedical Ontology, we think we're going to make it very easy to be able to link the kinds of requirements we have in the templates to available biomedical ontologies that we can access immediately online. So NCBO is a separate project which right now has a repository of about 430 uh, ontologies that are widely used in biomedicine. We have technology that we're going to be using in CEDAR that will allow us to take all these different kinds of ontologies and, when necessary, provide mechanisms to allow authors of, template, of, of the template data themselves to be able to refer to these ontologies and bring in the necessary terms. So our approach is one of facilitating template authoring, facilitating the instantiation of templates with each new data set, and being able to use that repository as the basis for predictive data entry. And so the repository becomes very important to us, seeing how related templates get filled in. But also, we believe we can go out to other kinds of online, online data sources, like the Gene Expression Omnibus, see how metadata have been entered there, and use that information to inform the predictive data entry. And also, we're looking forward to going out to resources like PubMed, where we can get the abstracts of the articles that refer to the experiments whose metadata, whose metadata we're capturing and see if natural language techniques will help us to fill in the templates better, and also provide links in the metadata repository to the online articles so that we can close the loop and have our ecosystem essentially include the structured metadata that, is, that are associated with the templated information, as well as links to the literature and other kinds of online, online data sets so that in, people who are using our online metadata repository as the basis of their queries can get much more information than will be accessible to the standard repositories that are currently being maintained. That's the goal, and obviously we're, we're very excited about that because we think we can make metadata authoring better. We think we can create smart, searchable templates that will make it easier to find data when they're online and to, re and to retrieve those data. We believe that we can use these patterns that we'll learn from the metadata repository to be able to fill in the blanks much more easily and basically to use text processing, as I said, from other repositories as the basis of filling in the metadata even better than it could be possible otherwise. We also think as a consequence we'll make the metadata themselves even better. We think that if we can do this kind of work, that we'll be able to use this CEDAR metadata repository as the basis for learning the patterns that will allow those metadata ultimately to be more comprehensive. We can augment those with links to the literature. We can augment them with retractions of the, of the, of the papers for which those uh, data were initially associated in the first place. We can augment those data with follow-up experiments. And basically, we can start to view the metadata in our repository not as a static representation of an experiment that was done at a fixed point in time, but rather as a place, if you will, where the scientific community can actually discuss a particular experiment and its reinterpretation over time as the data may be subject to secondary analyses, as there may be retractions in the literature, as new experiments come along. So the hope is, again, that this repository becomes a place where more information about scientific exp experiments will become available and the subject, then, of a new kind of information retrieval. So that's basically what CEDAR is going to be about. And as I said, we're all future tense, and I apologize for that, but I, I want to share with you the excitement that we have about being able to create this kind of infrastructure where we work on the idea of template definition, template instantiation, and then storing those uh, instantiated templates in a repository for a variety of future purposes. I think that's going to be pretty exciting to us. As I said, our initial sandbox, if you will, is going to be the HIPSI consortium. We're hoping that soon after that we'll be using the Stanford Digital Repository as a place where we'll be trying things out. And obviously, with uh, more experience, with more results to show, and hopefully with more funding, then other kinds of biomedical and even non-biomedical experiments could be subject to this kind of approach. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to come back and show you some, some real results in the future. Thanks. Steve, of course. So, first of all, fantastically exciting. It just shows, you know, you can work with colleagues and think you know what they're doing, but in fact, until you hear them talk about it, you have no idea really what they're doing. <laughs> um, so that was great. Uh, so I'm going to ask the kind of question that I know drives, uh, you know, uh, ontology guys nuts, but I just want to hear 
how you answer it. So again, it's starting where you ended up, which is natural language processing. So you hear over and over people saying that, you know, you know, Google search is taking over, you know, PubMed structured searches. Why, what's the best answer to, why do we put so much energy into this sort of structured um, uh, language when so many people in, are telling us that non-structured search technologies are improving and are going to make this uh, irrelevant or only a marginal addition? Well, as we saw when uh, Google Translate tried to work on that piece of German, uh, using just the text is not always enough. And even uh, Google will acknowledge now that although they, although they positioned themselves against Yahoo in the 1990s, 2000s, as a company that was going to be using purely data as opposed to structure, they've really done an about face. And a lot of what happens now when you search in Google is based on structured information that they have behind the scenes. It's not just the data. If you look at, at, at Google's website, you can learn about their knowledge graph, which is actually this enormous ontology of everything you would want to know about the world on the web. And they use that extensively when you do Google searches. And frankly, when you do a search and you see the structured information on the right-hand side of the page, that's all coming directly out of their structured knowledge graph. I don't think it's fair to say that one technology wins over the other. But I think certainly for the kind of work that we want to do in metadata, we think it makes much more sense to have structured data that are much more searchable than to have free text that has ambiguity and, frankly, where you're really at the whim of the metadata author to do a reasonable job. I think the structure actually here is going to be an advantage, and in particular, given the fact that we'll have the metadata repository from which we can learn the appropriate patterns, we think it'll be easier to make suggestions about what might be appropriate ways to fill in the blanks when we're dealing with a structured representation than if we let things completely open to natural language. I sense it's lunchtime. <laughs> no, Mike has to talk. Mike has to talk. Thank you so much. Amy.